Have you ever looked through a photo album? Well, most of us have. Perhaps uh, you've seen the pictures of uh, family, friends, maybe grandparents, maybe, maybe parents, maybe children when they were young. There are pictures there, pictures of us, pictures that uh, we don't want anyone else to see but us. And as we turn the pages of that photo album, uh, it is striking. We're looking at history. We're looking at our history. And as we turn those pages, we can cover years and years, even from one snapshot to the next. As we come to Revelation chapter 12, that is what God has done for us. He has given us pictures from history. Word pictures, snapshots that span hundreds and hundreds of years. And with each picture, with each snapshot, he pulls back the curtain of history. And he shows us what's been going on behind the scenes. He shows us the the history behind the history. He gives us a picture of what really happened. Not only does he do that, he gives us this picture from his perspective. And not only from his perspective, he gives it to us from the perspective of the enemy, from Satan. Revelation 11, remember, that angel who sounded... His trumpet, the seventh angel, sounded his trumpet, and it was the signal, the beginning, the announcement that the kingdom of this world had become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, that this world would no longer be under the rule and the authority and the dominion of the enemy. It was the signal that the final waves of judgment were about to be poured out on the people of the earth who refused to come to Christ. The final set of events that would lead to the coming of our Lord and Savior. Revelation 19.15 says that he will come and he will tread out the winepress of the fierce wrath of God and he will come and set up his kingdom forever. Blessed is he, we read in Matthew 23, who comes in the name of the Lord. Revelation chapter 11, we rejoiced. All of heaven rejoiced. It says, because thou hast taken thy power and thou hast begun to reign. But after this angel sounded his trumpet, these events, the effect of these events, aren't felt until Revelation chapter 15. So we come to Revelation chapter 12. We've stopped for a moment. God is about to give us a history lesson. He's about to uh, give us a lesson in word pictures, the history behind the picture, and it's unlike any history lesson that you have ever had before in school. You won't find this lesson anywhere else. And so he begins, begins the lesson in verse 1. He says this, a great sign, a Mega, semion, a symbol, a symbol of a great spiritual truth was seen. It appeared, it says, oreo, it was seen in heaven, in the sky. It said, it's a message from God, a message in word pictures, in symbols. If we can understand the symbols, maybe we can understand the message. Maybe we can understand the snapshot, the picture of history that God is trying to give us. And so John says in verse 1, I saw a woman. And he says this woman was clothed with the sun and the moon was under her under her feet and, her, and on her head he said there was a crown of 12 stars. That's quite a picture. It's a picture that takes us back to Genesis chapter 37, verse 9. It takes us back to a dream of a young man by the name of Joseph, the son of Jacob, a descendant of Abraham. Abraham was a man that God had promised to bless. 
He said he would bless him. He would make him a great nation. In fact, he said in Genesis 15 that his nation would be as the stars of the heavens. The family of Jacob would one day become that nation. They would become the nation of Israel. And so Joseph has this dream. And he dreams that the sun and the moon and eleven stars bow down before him. We're told that they represent his father and his mother and his eleven brothers. And he told this dream to his family. And as you might guess, this didn't make him very popular among the other members of the family. In fact, when they had the opportunity, his brothers sold him as a slave into Egypt and told their father that he had been killed by a wild animal. So Joseph ends up in Egypt as a slave. But then he becomes a leader. A leader in Egypt second only to the Pharaoh. But meanwhile, back home, back where his family was living, there was a famine. And we're told there was such a severe famine that they were on the verge of starvation. And so his brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. And when they got there, they stood before this leader and they bowed down before him. They didn't know it was their brother Joseph. His dream was being fulfilled. He had come to Egypt as a slave, but God used those circumstances, he used those events to save his family from starvation. You meant it for evil, Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, but God meant it for good. He meant it so that we might He might bring about the present result. What result? He said that he might save, that he might preserve many people alive. They had been preserved. They had been saved. They had been spared. The family of Jacob survived. They survived that famine and they would become the nation of Israel. A nation that's pictured here in Revelation 12.1. A, re- a, a picture of a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon, under her feet with a crown of 12 stars. It's a family portrait. It's a picture of the family of Jacob. It's a, a snapshot of the nation of Israel. But look closer at the picture. We might be in that picture too. There have been times that we've been dealt with unfairly, just like Joseph, haven't we? We might still feel the consequences of those wrongs that have been done to us. We might live with the hurt and the pain and the loss. But like Joseph, God will use those experiences in our lives if we will let him. And he will use them for the good, our good, and for the good of the people around us. Reminds us of a verse of scripture, doesn't it? Romans 8.28, it says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. We are certain and we are grounded in this fact. That we are in the hands of our God. And he is the one who will turn whatever happens into our life for our eternal good, for our blessing. He'll use it to bring glory to Christ. Isn't that what it's all about? To bring glory to Christ? He'll even use our sins. He'll use our failures. He'll use our mistakes. He'll use our lack of faith. He'll use all of the harsh obstacles that have been put in front of us in our lives. And he'll use those to refine us. 
He'll use those to purify us. He'll use those to make us more like Christ. He will use those experiences for blessing. And we may not see it now. We may not see it until we get home to heaven. But just like Joseph, if we will allow God to work in us, we will see the effect that Joseph had. He affected an entire nation. He was instrumental in the survival of an entire nation, a nation through which the Messiah would come. It's a snapshot. It's a picture of the nation of Israel. But you know, it's also a snapshot of something else. It's a snapshot of God's faithfulness to that nation, to his people. And perhaps it's a snapshot of his faithfulness to us. You know, despite their sin, despite their rebellion, God preserved that nation. He preserved the nation of Israel. Jeremiah 3, Hosea 2, God calls that nation his wife. He says, they're like a wife, a woman. A woman who has continually been unfaithful to him. So he chastened her because he wanted to bring her back to himself. He corrected her, but he never destroyed her. He never destroyed her because salvation, our salvation, would come through that nation. And so, take a closer look at the picture. Take a closer look at this woman in this snapshot. She's pregnant. says in verse 2, this woman was with child and she cried out being in labor. And in pain to give birth. So, this woman is about to have a child. Genesis chapter 3. You'll recall that after the sin and the disobedience of Adam and Eve, Eve was told that in pain all women would give birth to their children. All women. The pain... It's a reminder. It's a reminder to all of us that every time a child is born into the world, there is joy, but there is also the pain of knowing that there are consequences of sin. Consequences for all of us who are born into this world. That's what God's telling us there. That we are all sinners. We are all born as sinners. And there is the painful consequence of separation from him forever as a result of that sin. But God also told Eve something else. He told her that her and her descendants would bring forth a child. There would be one who would come, who would triumph over our sin, who would triumph over the serpent, uh, the chaya, the one who hisses, the one who whispered in her ear, the one who deceived her. He told her in Genesis 3.15 that a child would come forth who would bruise the serpent's head. It's the first promise from God of a Savior. A promise that there would be one who would free us from our sin. Genesis chapter 3. God shared this information with Adam. He shared the information with Eve, but he also shared it with the serpent. The serpent knew that there would be one who would come someday. One who would be born, who would defeat him. He knew that there would be a woman. A woman from among God's people. A woman from among the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A woman from the nation of Israel who would come as a deliverer and as a savior. He knew that right from the beginning. That's why he attempted to destroy the Hebrews when they were in bondage in Egypt. How did he do that? Exodus 1 verses 15 and 16. He used Pharaoh. He used the the ruler of Egypt. The Pharaoh told the midwives that when they were delivering, helping to deliver the Hebrew babies, all the male children were to be killed. That was the plan. Kill the male babies. Destroy the nation. There would be no savior. 
There would be no one who would be born who would bruise the serpent. The enemy used Pharaoh. It's like he uses a lot of people. It's why the nation of Israel has suffered so much throughout their history. It's why they have been under the attack of the enemy. Because it is from that nation that our Savior, our Redeemer, would come. Isaiah 9, verse 6, the prophet Isaiah said this, A child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and there will be no end to the increase of his government and of peace. On the throne of David, and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it, in justice and in righteousness from this time and forevermore. It's the promise, words written 800 years before Jesus was born, that there would be one who would come. These are words of life and hope for all of God's people, but these are words of death for the enemy, because these words speak of his final fall, his final downfall, his loss of control over the people over the kingdom of the earth. Pull back the curtain of history. We see that history really has been a struggle between God's people from the nation of Israel and the enemy. A struggle. An attempt by the enemy to stop Christ from being born. That's what it's all been about. And even though they they don't know it, the attempts to destroy them have really been Satan's attempts to destroy the hope of a Savior. Christ. The promise given to Eve back in Genesis chapter 3. And even though we may not know it, the attempts to destroy us come from the same place. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Is is that what it says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12? Our struggle isn't against the people. It's not against the circumstances. Our real enemy is the serpent. Satan. And he uses our weaknesses. He uses our strengths. He uses whatever he thinks he can use against us. Sometimes he'll even use people that we love. People that we trust to discourage us. To make us feel like we don't even want to go on anymore. Maybe we can find ourselves in this picture of this woman who's pregnant. She's a woman in labor. She's struggling, just like we struggle against the enemy. So we turn, turn the page of the photo album. We see the next snapshot, the next picture, verse 3. It says, another sign, uh, another message and symbol appeared, it says, in the sky. Verse 3, John says, behold, pay attention to this, he says. This was an incredible sight. He says, I saw a great red dragon. A dracon in Greek, a monster. Who is it? What is it? Revelation 20, verse 2 tells us. It says he is the dragon. He is the serpent of old. He is the devil. He is Satan. Now, we have to interpret that one. It's the serpent from the Garden of Eden. That's who this dragon is. It's interesting that the... Uh, The Hebrew word in the Old Testament for for dragon and for monster and for sea monster, and there's one word uh, for serpent, all have the same root word in Hebrew. They all go back to the same word. It's the word tan. It's interesting what that word means. It means jackal, little animal, like a fox that... uh, Travels in packs. That's uh, a scavenger. That's vicious. 
that attacks not only dead flesh, but dying flesh. Isn't that a picture of the enemy? He is a monster. He shows no mercy. He's a serpent, he's a deceiver, and he's a liar. He is the devil, he's a malicious slanderer. He is Satan. He is our enemy. He is the enemy of our souls. But he is also a jackal. He is vicious. And verse 3 tells us he's red. Why red? Puros in Greek. Fiery red. Glowing like a flame. He's red like blood. What is God trying to tell us here? Well, it's the same word, the same color that we saw back in Revelation 6-4. Remember that red horse? Same word. What did that horse bring? What did that horse and rider bring? They brought bloodshed, and they brought war, and violence, and murder. And that's what he brings. That's what the enemy brings. That is why God has pictured him here as red. What did Jesus say about him in John 8.44? He said, he was a murderer from the very beginning. That's him. That's the picture of him. But this picture gets even more unusual. Verse 3 says that he had seven, seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems, seven royal crowns, like a king. That is an unusual picture, isn't it? Well, as is true with some pictures, some photographs, that we look at, if we look a little closer, that picture will reveal something about that person. And that's what this does. This picture reveals something about this dragon. It helps us to understand a spiritual truth. Isn't that what God said he was going to do? These were spiritual truths that he was going to reveal to us through this vision. The number seven speaks of fullness, of completeness, doesn't it? Seven heads, seven nations, seven kingdoms, seven empires, seven rulers, horns, power, might, crowns, they speak of authority, don't they? Pull back the curtain. Pull back the curtain and we see, we get a clearer picture of the enemy through this. He is the evil influence behind the nations of the world. He uses them to hurt, to destroy, to persecute God's people. He's the unseen power behind all of the wicked events that we see in the news, that we've seen throughout all of history. He's there. He's the source of the depravity in many cultures, in many families. And he is the one who has led a rebellion against the authority of God Almighty. He was an angel. He was an angel in heaven. Ezekiel 28.14 says that he was an anointed cherub, powerful, stood before God. But he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be exalted above God. He wanted to rule the universe. And so he rebelled against God, and now his kingdom is here on earth. But he doesn't just influence things that go on here. He's influenced things in heaven. That's what it says in verse 4. It says that his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. He deceived and he influenced a third of the angels of heaven. And it says they rebelled against him. They rebelled against the authority of God. And they were thrown down. It says they were sorrow. They were dragged down from heaven to earth. That's not where they belong. They belong in heaven, don't they? Isn't that their place? God created them to worship Him, to praise Him. They are the morning stars that we read about in Job chapter 38. But now, 
They're demons. They are demons from the pit of hell. Enemies of God. And now they serve Satan. They are an army. And they are an army that is set against the Messiah. Set against the only one who can stop this dragon from ruling the earth and from destroying the people on the earth. We pull back the curtain of time. It says it is time for the Messiah to be born. It's time for God to enter the world as an infant, as a child. It's time for Christ to come to bruise the serpent. Yeah, but this time the dragon's ready. And he stands with an army of demons. Verse 4, it says, The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Well, this must be plan B. He couldn't, uh, he was powerless to stop the birth of the Messiah. He's tried, didn't he? Tried to destroy an entire nation. But he failed. So now, if he can't destroy the birth of the child, perhaps he can kill the child when the child's born. He knows the scriptures. He knows them better than we do. He knows where the child will be born. He knows Micah 5 too. He knows that this child will be born in Bethlehem Ephratah. And so he's waiting. He's ready. Verse 5 says, and so she gave birth to a son, to a male child. The Messiah has been born, but he's in danger. He's in danger from the enemy. It says in Matthew 2.13, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, arise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Remain there till I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child. To destroy him. Verse 16, it continues there. Herod sent and he slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and its environs from two years old and under. Just like he attempted to kill the Messiah from By not even allowing to be born, he used Pharaoh. Just like that, the enemy uses Herod to kill the Hebrew male children in Bethlehem in an attempt to kill the Messiah. But he failed again. He failed during Jesus' entire life, didn't he? Even people from his own town, Nazareth, wanted to take him and throw him off a cliff. But he failed. You know, he is wicked, he is vicious, he is evil. But he doesn't know everything. And he is unable to stop the plan of God. What an encouragement to those brothers and sisters who first heard these words read to them in this letter. What an encouragement to them to know that the enemy has failed. What an encouragement to us to know that he has failed and he will fail again. Verse 5 says, Christ is the one who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. He is the shepherd. He is the one who will lead. He is the one who has authority over the nation. It's, It's his kingdom. It's his to rule. He is the rightful ruler of heaven and of earth. He has been the perfect sacrifice and so he has defeated sin and death and the grave and he has bruised the serpent's head. And now he's risen from the dead. Risen from the grave. Verse 5. It says, her child was caught up to God, to his throne. He's ascended. He's ascended back into heaven to the glory that he had from eternity. Now he's seated at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to make intercession for us. Those were two quick snapshots, weren't they? We went all the way from the birth of Christ all the way to his ascension back up into heaven. Why? We, there were some pictures I thought we would see in between. But no. Why? 
verse, it speaks of the bottom line. It speaks of the end result. God says it is finished. He has promised to bring forth a Savior. Genesis chapter 3. And he has accomplished that and Christ is back in heaven. Mission completed. This is a picture here. A victory. It's a picture of victory. The enemy no longer has power over us. That's the victory. But for the serpent, for the enemy, it's defeat. It's failure once again. Christ has returned to heaven as the victor. Colossians 2.15, it says this, Christ has disarmed the rulers and the authorities. Apekduomai. He has stripped them of their power. It says in that verse, and he made a public display of victory. That's the picture we have here. That's the picture God is giving us. This is a picture of victory. Turn the page. Turn the page of the photo album. Look at the next snapshot. Takes us all the way into the future. And though the enemy knows that his time is coming to an end, he continues to wage war against God's people. He does it today, and he will do it into the future. He'll do it all the way into the tribulation, all the way up till the end. Verse 6 says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days, three and a half years. It's the last part of the tribulation. Satan is persecuting God's people, even then. Just as he used Pharaoh, just as he used Herod, just as he uses people today, he will use a man, a man that we are told is called a beast in Revelation eleven seventeen, a man who will come and who will persecute and who will hunt down God's people because he is under the influence of the enemy. Just like Pharaoh, just like Herod. Indeed, Paul said to Timothy, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's no surprise. If we're serious about following Jesus Christ, Paul said we won't have to go looking for persecution. It'll find us. Why? Because Christ has ascended to heaven. The hatred and the persecution that was directed towards him by the enemy, where do you think it gets directed towards? To us. To those who belong to him. Satan hates us. Why? Because he hates Christ. He persecutes us. Why? Because he persecuted Christ. He attempts to bring evil against us, but stop. God says, that's far enough. God will use it for our good. He will use it to bring glory to Christ. Once again, the enemy has failed. He's a failure. People forget that. He hasn't done anything here. I can see where he's accomplished anything except to fail. The serpent has been bruised. He has been crushed. The dragon has been defeated. And so now we can give glory to our Savior, to our Lord, to our God, to our King who died for us. Glory to the one, Jude said, who guards us and who keeps us and who will safely bring us home to heaven forever to stand in the presence of his glory. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.